Hi everybody, Penn here with Yoga Sizes. Welcome to the Yoga Sizes podcast and YouTube channel. I have Janae here today with us today. Her last name, she says she doesn't really say her last name, so she just prefers Janae, so we'll go with that. And she's a certified yoga teacher with, um, she's Yoga Alliance certified, experienced yoga teacher, 500 hours, um, I guess. If we can go over that a little more about in terms of like which one is considered experience and how many hours re required teaching experience to get that certification. And um, she loves outdoor activities and she's doing Raja Hatha Yoga. And um, thank you for being on with us today. Really thrilled to have you here. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> Thanks. So we'll get started with um, how you got started with yoga and why you choose Raja Hatha Yoga. So uh, I started practicing yoga in 2000. I went to college in Boston and they offered a Svarupa practice for free at our school. Well, you could take it for credit, but I decided to just audit it because I had enough going on in my schedule and uh, all my friends were doing it. So I said, oh, I'll go and try this thing. And that was my introduction into the practice. And uh, being that it was early 2000s, there wasn't a lot of opportunities to practice yoga. So once that course ended, I had to start seeking out other practices. And uh, luckily, there were um, a few different studios in the area that I could get to. And I got to experience uh, vinyasa. I got to experience uh, the Bikram, the hot yoga. And ultimately, I ended up uh, you know, completing my degree program and deciding to move uh, down south uh, to New York. And uh, while I was there, joined a gym. The te there was one uh, teacher there who I really liked a lot. And I started practicing with her. And she strong-armed me, basically, into uh, becoming a yoga teacher. And I didn't know anything about it. I, I love her to death. She's one of my dearest friends. But she basically said, you have to go through my teacher training. And I said, I can't. I'm studying for my master's degree. And she goes, I'll give you a scholarship. And I said, OK, I'll go through the training. And so uh, she developed the Raja Hatha uh, yoga teacher training. And um, that's how I ended up in this lineage. And it's been this ongoing study and practice of really understanding what that is since then. That's awesome. So tell us more about Raja Hatha Yoga. How is it different than just Hatha Yoga? <laughs> so, uh, so I like to define both of those words. So Hatha. Hatha is the effortful practice. It, that's how it's translated. And uh, the way I describe it is anybody who's practicing poses and breathing at the same time is practicing Hatha Yoga. So you can be practicing vinyasa, you can be practicing anusara, you can be practicing ashtanga, you could be doing on a forest, whatever it is, if you're breathing and moving at the same time, that's hatha. And in the hatha yoga pradipika, the poses are described and it talks a lot about the body. The other side of that is raja yoga. Raja is, uh, translates as classical yoga or uh, royal yoga. And so Raja is the mindfulness practice. So those of you that are familiar with the Yoga Sutra and Patanjali, that's Raja yoga. And so basically to simplify the description, instead of giving you the full uh, explanation my teacher gives, Raja Hatha is the combining of the mindful and the physical at the same time. So every practice that I teach includes uh, a Dharma talk. So there's a philosophical focus that uh, threads through the entirety of the class. And then all of the postures align with that physical, that philosophical focus. And then there's this attention given to uh, breathing and then also attention given to uh, energetic shift and understanding how that philosophy aligns with what we're doing as we move. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So how long do these classes usually run for? Oh, so when I first began teaching, they were 90 minutes long and it was the best. We would do this great Dharma focus and then we would do this deep asana practice and this incredibly long corpse pose with deep relaxation. Uh, the times are changing. And uh, as our culture around yoga has changed, uh, there are more and more 60 minute classes. I've, I've pushed 
uh, to get my classes back up to 75 minutes. I really wish I could be at 90 minutes, but what I found is that people aren't willing to dedicate 90 minutes of their time to these classes. So my classes are all 75 minutes now and I've got a good group that, that's comfortable with that. Awesome, okay. Let's go into more detail about Dharma Talk. What is that like? Um, is there like an example of how people can um, basically do that uh, on their own or they, they follow a teacher to, with the guidelines? So a Dharma Talk basically is a um, conversation at the beginning of class. Usually it's like a little mini lecture. And uh, the teacher who's guiding the practice will choose that topic. Uh, so for example, I plan out my entire year. So uh, at the end of this year, I'll sit down and I'm looking at it right now. It sits beside me, actually. Every month, I have a different focus point. And then every week, I break down what I'm going to focus on during the week so that I can keep my brain focused because I'm, of course, always studying multiple things. But uh, basically, for example, this month, uh, we're discussing the sound vibration of OM. And I've broken down that into three different specific sounds, ah, ooh, and mm. And we're discussing... Uh, the first week of the month, we discussed what does ah mean? What is it related to? And so, for example, I'd say, okay, so we have a sound ah. And ah is this outward expression. It's, it's putting yourself out into the world. It's creation. It's shakti. And so we spent the whole week focusing on that. And so what I do at the beginning of each class is I'll choose a specific aspect and say, today, you know, let's consider shakti, the creator. Let's consider our ability to create. And the fact that in order to create, you have to draw from that which you already have, from your knowledge, your wisdom, your experience. And so as you move through your postures today, consider your experience with these poses before. How can you create something new here? How can you experience something new? How can you put something more into this pose than you ever have before? And so that's kind of like a little 30 second Dharma talk, usually mine are anywhere from three to five minutes. And my teacher, hers can go up to 15 minutes, <laughs> depending on the kind of day she's having. But so basically, as a teacher, if you're incorporating Dharma talks, um, it's really important that you have a refined knowledge of what you're talking about, or that you are actively studying that topic, and you're ready to share it with your practitioners uh, in a way that they can grasp and understand it so that it's tangible for them in the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I've been to classes like that, although I didn't fully study that type of uh, yoga, but um, it's really, I love it. It's because you really get to, like learn more and also learn their style of teaching that topic not just absolutely like it or you know, things like that. yeah and there's so much interpretation out there i'm i'm always reading a modern i'm always reading a lot of books but <laughs> usually i have a modern text out um, that I'm referencing. And then at the same time, for example, like I'll be reading an ancient text and I'll be trying to decipher what is that ancient text trying to explain to us and how does that relate to what's going on in the world today? Mm -hmm. So do you teach in just um, use regular terms that people understand like corpse pose or uh, downward facing dog or do you use, also use Sanskrit to, to teach in your poses? I do use the Sanskrit pose names. Usually what I do is uh, I'll start the class with a combination of the two. So for example, when we're going through our um, sun salutation series, I'll start and say, all right, we'll begin with sun salutation, Surya Namaskar. And then I'll go on and say, dive your arms overhead, urdhvastasana, bring your hands together, down to your heart, samastiti. And I'll keep going through class that way until probably about halfway class, I'll just drop the English unless it's shorter to say, uh, particularly in a vinyasa class, because it gets to a point where saying Adho Mukha Svanasana every time gets to be a little tedious and it's easier to just go, okay, down dog. <laughs> so, uh, but I do honor that. And I feel like Sanskrit is this universal language. If we all used the Sanskrit terms um, that the yo ancient yogis assigned to these postures, uh, I think it makes it a lot more accessible so that no matter where you travel in the world, you know what pose they're saying. Um, I know Americans like to make things their own and we're very good at that, uh, but even I find myself getting confused when a teacher says, calls a pose a name that I've never heard of, and then I have to stop in the middle of my practice and look around and look up and try and decipher what, what pose did that teacher want us to go to. Yeah, not only that, but um, also in terms of the pronunciation, just something simple, similar, simple thing like uh, chakra. Like some teachers say chakra and some say chakra. And, and also <laughs> like with, I, I was just uh, doing another interview 
about yoga nidra. Some say yoga nidra, and then all of a sudden, recently, I've been hearing yoga nedra. So I'm like, oh my goodness, uh, am I pronouncing it wrong? Or which one is <laughs> right? There are some really great resources for that. Um, I, I like to use um, AJ Mohan's book, which is the language of yoga. Uh, because there's a video, there's a, a, sorry, an audio recording that goes along with it. So you can listen to them. And when I was going through my 200 hour, my first teacher training, I used to love listening to it. And then I'd walk around the house going, Adho Mukha Svana Sana. Cause that's how he would say it because he's trying to get us English speakers to be able to say the words. Um, there are some words that we as Americans or, you know, who've not, who are not, um, from uh, India, we just can't say them. Um, I always think of like Agya, Agya Chakra, right? So mm -hmm. A-J-N-A, <laughs> and I had to practice it a lot. And there's some really great Sanskrit scholars who are out there who um, they do the pronunciation and you can sit there and listen and go over it and over it. And I've been practicing saying all the, all the chakras properly. Uh, because I know I've been saying them American style for far too long. And it's, if I'm going to do this right, I better study up and do it properly. Right. Yeah, it's really important. And um, at one point, I even hear some people say, Sakasan. They don't even say that. Oh. Asana, apart, right? <laughs> Sukasan. It's like, yeah. it's there. So it's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's dialectal, though, I think, uh, depending on where you grew up or how you were trained. Because I, I know there's a difference between the... Um, uh, the Tibetan pronunciation and then the traditional um, Hindu pronunciation. So I don't, I, I don't know that much, but I know, I know that's exist in existence. <laughs> it's interesting. And some yeah. people just, especially it depends on their teachers too, right? How they learn from their teacher and how it's passed down. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, what's important I think as yoga teachers too, is that we're, we're learning as well. And so I readily admit to, those teachers that I train or um, my students, when I learn something new, like pranayam, it's not pranayama, which I said for so long. And my teacher, she refined her knowledge and she goes, hey, it's, it's pranayam. We have to say this correctly. And so then I went back to my students. I'm like, you guys, it's pranayam. We have to practice saying pranayam. And then all my teacher trainees, I would correct them every time I go, nope, it's pranayam. We got to say pranayam. That's the correct way to say it. So yeah, we have to constantly be learning and studying and admitting, hey, I learned something new. I was wrong before. Experienced certified Yoga Alliance teacher. And <laughs> that's 500 hours. Does that work? Um, what do you need to get that experienced under your title for? for? Yeah, so I, uh, I attended my 200-hour teacher training back in 2000 to 2005. Yoga Alliance was just a little baby uh, back then. And um, their requirements were after your 200 hours um, training, you had to then teach for a thousand hours before you could go and study for the next level, which at that time it was 500. Um, and this is where things can get kind of confusing because I didn't go for 500 more hours of training. I did 300 more hours of training and 300 plus 200 equals 500. And then uh, once I received my 500 Yoga Alliance's requirements are you have to teach for 2000 hours after you complete that 500 in order to be recognized as ERYT, Experienced Registered Yoga Teacher. Uh, and so since then, I, so I've completed my two, um, 500 hour back in 2010. And I couldn't even tell you how many hours I've taught at this point. I, I've owned my own, I own my own yoga studio. I teach a lot of private booking. So basically it's about um, not just hours taught, but then about continued study. And uh, Yoga Alliance used to require that we would track all of our hours and then track all of the books we've read and track all of the trainings we've gone to. Um, I've reached a point now where my continuing ed, ed is just so continuous that um, every time it's time to renew, I, I put in what's most relevant. Uh, but basically, that ERYT status is proof that you've continued to teach, you've continued to learn, you're continuing to um, study on your own, Svathyaya, and then you're also continuing to um, practice with more experienced teachers, which gets really tricky. The longer you teach for, uh, the more difficult it gets to find teachers who are more experienced than you are to learn from. Yeah, I'm 500 hours certified as well. I did a 200 and then I did three 
100 hour teacher trainings to combine <laughs> those to become 500 hour and i know um, i've interviewed somebody before and i know some other people are also like basically not wanting to keep up with their certification as yoga alliance teacher but they they still teach and i know in yoga studios if you're an owner or if you practice at yoga studios or at gyms they look at the certifications but i don't think it's as relevant as people make it and some people say just like a, a money thing you know if you pay them and then they, they keep your certification up there's really not like you know, the whole credibility thing and, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say I disagree with that. So I also, my, I run a yoga teacher training program. As I mentioned, it's a registered yoga school through Yoga Alliance. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I truly value uh, what they expect of me as a teacher who's running a training program. I also have a master's degree in counseling and worked in an elementary school as a school counselor for eight years. So I've written curriculum. And uh, I, when I wrote my 200 hour training that I now uh, provide for people who wanna be teachers, I wrote my curriculum based on how I would write a college course. And um, when I applied to be a registered yoga school, Yoga Alliance wanted to see my full course. They wanted to see my exam. They wanted to know what my requirements are. And I feel that's really important to have another body, an overseeing body, look at what I've created and say, hey, yeah, this, this aligns with other schools. And I love that idea. And I think Yoga Alliance is trying better and better at saying, hey, there's a certain level of quality uh, in teacher training and in um, and for teachers. And we want to honor this because what I've also found as a studio owner is that when a teacher comes to me and wants to teach at my studio and they say, oh, well, I did a, um, a month long intensive training with so and so. They, are, they have huge gaps in their training and in their, their understanding of yoga and their understanding of the histories and the philosophies of the practices. And, um, and I feel like Yoga Alliance is setting a bar. And as yoga teachers, I feel like we all need to be at the highest level as we can be. Uh, and so I appreciate what Yoga Alliance does. It also gives me as a yoga studio owner and a teacher trainee, uh, trainer, um, something to qualify people with, uh, because otherwise, you know, there's no consistency. And, and that's really important too, is that in my studio, at least there's consistency among the teachers and as they're speaking in Sanskrit or explaining history or giving their Dharma talk that we're all on the same page. And there isn't this confusion among my practitioners about what every teacher is saying. That makes sense because the, the baseline of um, yeah. what you can do with what you learn and how you can, you know, teach others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. um, I also see that you do retreats too, right? Yeah, so I'm actually, um, I closed my studio, well, I moved out of my studio uh, back in um, August of 2019, and I... Uh, I'm expanding into a new market, which is uh, retreats, uh, but I'm doing it a little differently from how most retreats are done. And um, that's what's taken so long as I've been shopping for a new location that's right. I want to do it right. I want to do it well. And uh, so I'm opening a business. It's already active. It's called Tahoe Bliss Retreats. And the idea is to create adventure um, and experience retreats that are customized and uh, curated for each individual group. So instead of, um, you know, saying, hey, let's go to Tahoe for the weekend and then trying to figure out what to do and, you know, trying to figure out what's open and what's available and how much it's going to cost, uh, you would be able to just call Tahoe Bliss Retreats or email. There's simple forms to fill out on the website and say, hey, we're going to come during these dates. Here's what we're interested in. And then Tahoe Bliss plans your entire uh, stay in Tahoe, everything from your location uh, of stay to your food and then to the activities and adventures you get to do. So uh, it's about exploring Tahoe and experiencing all the stuff that we love about um, the area. So that's, that's Tahoe Bliss. <laughs> that sounds exciting. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's, just, it's, you know, for me, it's yoga as a whole, instead of saying, oh, hey, why don't we include a yoga practice? It's no, let's really go practice yoga. Let's get out there. Let's explore the world. Let's notice how we feel is where stand up paddling for the first time or hiking through the woods or, you know, um, exploring the mountains and learning about the environment. Um, that's, it's more about yoga as a whole rather than just the asana and the postures. Mm-hmm. It's important to just get out there in nature and, and practice in that environment. And uh, you did mention that you love outdoor activities. So what are some of the outdoor activities that you love to do and how you kind of incorporate, embed yoga with it? Mm. Uh, so um, I do it all, <laughs> basically. I, I During the summer months, I road bike a lot. I do a lot of commuting on my bicycle because it's the easiest way to get around town. And I love my road bike. In fact, uh, I have it set up in my basement right now so I can spin all winter long on my trainer and everybody's like, are you crazy? I'm like, well, sometimes you can't get out and ride your bike because it's a little icy or mucky or wet or whatever. Uh, And then I also mountain bike. I uh, love to hike. I cross country ski, I snowshoe, I downhill ski, I backcountry ski. And then I also love to stand up paddleboard. In the summer months, I water ski. I love to swim on the lake. And uh, you can usually get me out on a boat without uh, too much pressure. So uh, that's the great thing about where I live is it's this place where you can have all these incredible adventures. And um, we love to have what we call um, three activity days. So it's about, you know, how many things can I do in a single day? Can I like downhill ski in the morning? Can I go for a road bike ride in the valley in the afternoon? And then maybe in the evening, I'll go for a stand up paddle uh, out on the lake while it's calm. That's awesome. So um, <laughs> what do you do like in terms of nutrition wise like, uh, to keep up with your energy to doing all these outdoor <laughs> activities and teach and running the programs? And I eat a lot of food. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, you know, you know I, I live a yogic lifestyle. So, of course, you know, all these activities you know, I'm always very conscious of what I'm going to do and what I need in order to prepare for that. And then also the recovery side of those activities. And I always tell everybody my asana complements all those other activities. If I don't do my yoga asana, then I'm probably going to feel beat up and my muscles are going to be tight and I'm going to be uncomfortable. But um, I, I do live a fairly traditional Western life um, and I do eat a fairly traditional Western diet. Um, I really enjoy vegetables a lot, but my husband likes meat and potatoes. So uh, we tend to have a blend of those two things in our diet. My plate will usually be loaded up with all the veggies and he gets most of the potatoes. Um, But I eat a variety of foods. I'm not really too crazy about my nutrition, um, but I have learned that Every decade is a new adventure in eating and your body responds differently. But, um, you know, one of the big questions I get from my practitioners is, are you vegetarian? And um, my answer is always no, not purely, uh, but I don't enjoy meat and I never have. Uh, I was raised on a farm, so I know about what happens to the meat and that doesn't bother me. I just don't like the taste. Uh, I don't like the texture. So um, I eat chicken and fish. Those are my two favorite things. If you offer me an oyster, I'm never going to say no. Um, But then I also really enjoy things like, you know, roasted broccoli and uh, quinoa. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to try most things. In fact, I tried escargot for the first time the other night and it was tasty. So I was like, pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty balanced. Yeah. I, I eat a lot of food. I mean, I'm not going to lie, but I try to eat healthy foods. One of my favorite snacks is just a bowl of nuts. I try to keep one by my desk and I'm always snacking on uh, whatever's by my desk. So I try to make sure it's healthy food. That's awesome. Yeah. It's good to have um, snacks around instead of like just not eating for so long and then eat a whole bunch. It's really not that good if you do no, it. No, that, that, that leads to bloating and other things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so besides the move, the exercise and the, the dieting and, and not dieting, but more like healthy eating lifestyle, um, is there like a specific type of things that you do, like a routine that you have to follow on a daily basis? So, uh, I'm really good at, um, 
having a flexible schedule, but there are things that I myself, I need every day that I've learned. Um, so I know that um, in the mornings I have an hour long silent sitting practice. So what I do is I set my alarm um, for an hour before I need to actually be up and out of bed and like moving around. And then I do a seated, uh, just a silent sitting. It's not focused. I don't have any mantra practice or any specific breathing. It's more about taking those valuable moments between sleep and awake, um, wherein I'm not fully conscious yet. And, and my brain hasn't started chattering, you know, that chitta vritti just starts going. Um, I take that time I give myself an hour of sitting upright and just kind of filtering out whatever remains from my sleep and then allowing myself to like clear my head before I begin the day. And usually what starts to happen is I get this inkling like, oh, hey, that alarm's going to go off. It's been about an hour. And that's when my brain will start to shift. I'll start to think about the day. But it really sets me up well so that I can be ready to go for the day instead of like, popping out of bed and being like, okay, what's happening now? And then the other thing that I know that I've learned that my body really needs is I need some athletic activity every day. Um, I've learned that um, I don't necessarily need an asana practice. I don't need to go through those postures. Uh, as a teacher, I'm doing a lot of demonstrating and I've learned to discern between which poses to demonstrate because they also benefit me and which poses I can kind of just guide and allow everybody else to go through. But if I don't get a bicycle ride in or a run or a, you know some skiing in or whatever it is, I, I know that it changes my energy and my attitude. So that physically active part and then that silent sitting part are my two really necessary portions in my day mm, that's awesome um great love that and um <laughs> so books what are some of your <laughs> book recommendations yeah um so my teacher wrote a book and i shamelessly promote it for her all the time because i think it's absolutely wonderful it's a companion book to uh reading the yoga sutra and it's called living the sutra and the great thing is it's a journaling book. So what she did is she took our Dharma talks, right? And um, she and Kelly DiNardo worked together. And what they did was broke down um, the, basically the yamas and the niyamas and give little, they gave little descriptions, little Dharma focuses for each, and then a little journaling activity. So I highly recommend it if, um, if you're beginning that practice of trying to understand the sutra, if you're trying to understand how the heck do the yamas and niyamas apply to my life? Because when there's something like brahmacharya, we're talking about celibacy and it's like, well, am I really that into it? They break it down a little, a little more for modern times. So um, I keep it, I reference it all the time. Um, I also reference the Yoga Sutra all the time. My copy of the Yoga Sutra is so worn that the book is falling apart and the binding is broken. I need a new copy desperately. Um, but those are the two that I'm mainly reading. And then um, right now, I don't recommend it, but I'm reading um, the Yoga Vashista, which is one of those ancient texts that I've decided to dive into. And um, I'm learning more about that aspect of, of yoga and the, um, how those stories are told. It's basically a lot of stories about um, who we are and uh, how we came to be and, and what we are beyond these physical bodies. Um, but if you're looking for kind of a more mellow and easy read. I tell everybody to read How Yoga Works. Um, it's a great little story that introduces you to the concepts of yoga. And um, it's by Michael Roach. And it's just a nice little story to read. And, and both of those are Raja yoga books. So they give you a great introduction into the, the roots, the, the mindfulness aspects of yoga. That's awesome. Okay, we're gonna check those out. And, yeah. Um, so your programs and everything, how the, do they work? Uh, how long they run for? And you do private, you do um, online, in the studio or? Yeah, so uh, studio classes right now, I'm actually collaborating with some local organizations. Uh, we have a beautiful little space that we are borrowing from the Tahoe Art League. So it's just, so cool because every time you come in there's new artwork on the walls it's a great open space really bright and happy and everybody who comes in really loves it so they've been super kind uh funnily enough um on fridays i offer a class at our local brewery which was like 
was like, I don't know how this is going to work, but it's actually been lovely. Um, the brewery is always warm and humid, so it gives us a different feel. And we're practicing before the brewery opens, so it's fairly peaceful in there. Uh, but those are the scheduled classes. And of course, once I'm in the new space, there'll be a whole new uh, collection of uh, classes you can attend live with me. Uh, and then my yoga teacher training program is uh, offered exclusively as an individualized training right now. So I went back, you know, it's interesting because as more and more yoga teacher trainings and practices and studios pop up and it's these huge gatherings of like 40 people in a class or teacher trainings that are like 30 people, I've been going the other way. And my classes are getting smaller. Um, I really prefer to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I feel it's far more effective and we can get deeper into the practice. And uh, so my teacher training is one-on-one. -on -one. It takes a minimum of six months to complete, but uh, we do that flexibly based on my schedule and, and your schedule if you're training with me. And uh, I have teachers that have taken six months and they just wanted to be you know, on that schedule and get it finished. And then I have teachers that are taking a couple of years to go through it. And make sure, and they're making sure like they really comprehend and understand and have a solid grasp of what they're being taught. And then my private uh, sessions are um, on location. So I come to you uh, in my home studio, which is where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and uh, eventually, of course, they, um, they'll be in the new studio space. And then I also do those one-on-one -on -one over uh, live video like you and I are doing today. And so I offer this variety, but um, what I really enjoy and what I really feel is um, most valuable is, is the one-on-one -on -one time and really diving deeply into each individual and trying to figure out, you know, what is your dharma? You know, what is, what is driving you? What are your desires? And, and how can we get you to the place where you need to be so that you feel content, you feel healthy, and you're in a state of sattva or harmony. That's great. That sounds amazing. Um, so what are the, your, like, your offers? Uh, oh, of, the um, <laughs> discounts for, I, I, I'm, Normally, I'd offer my realignment coaching sessions. Those are $100 for an hour session. But for those folks that have um, joined us today, it's uh, $50. And that's either in studio or video conference. And those are scheduled, um, again, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and based on both our schedules. Uh, for anybody that is visiting the Tahoe area, uh, you can schedule that face-to-face um, -face session with me um, at the same rate. And then I'm also offering the opportunity to join some of our scheduled classes, either at the Art League or at the brewery for $50. And there is a link um, that you can access in order to uh, see those discounts. So please don't share that unless you're sharing this video so that people can uh, get watch uh, what we've spoken about and then get that discount. Awesome, great. Thank you very much. And um, uh, the links so well uh, you, you want to just uh, verbally share the links well i do want people to know your how to find you on your social media and how they can reach you yeah so um i'm assuming we can pop that link in right underneath the youtube video so that people can access it down below and then uh, laketahoyoga.com is my website. So all the information for scheduled classes, et cetera, is on there. There's also a button on there for retreats, and that'll take you over to Tahoe Bliss if you want to check those out. If you're planning a trip to Tahoe or an event or a bachelorette party, anything like that. Uh, and then, of course, all my social media links are on there. Generally, everything is Lake Tahoe Yoga. Uh, Facebook is the only one that's Lake Tahoe Yoga Studio. Uh, but if you type in Lake Tahoe Yoga, we should pop up and uh, we have pretty good search engine optimization. So we'll pop up first on Google if, uh, if you've got everything typed in accurately. Awesome. Great, great. Thank you so much. And I'll have those links available for everybody. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Thanks.